Welcome to Saving Castles, the podcast for castle and chateau enthusiasts. Join us as we explore the fascinating history, stories and culture of these awe-inspiring structures, from the legends and folklore to the latest in restoration. We'll cover it all, so whether you're a seasoned castle aficionado or just discovering the magic of these magnificent buildings, this is the podcast for you. So grab your headphones and let's dive in. It's the late 12th century, a period in history steeped in conflict and change. Across Europe and the Middle East, kingdoms are grappling for power, territories are being carved and reshaped, and beneath this turbulent surface, religious tensions simmer and froth threatening to spill all over. It's within this tempestuous climate that our protagonist, Richard I, known more famously as Richard the Lionheart, the King of England, rises. To truly comprehend Richard and the Siege of Acre, we must first immerse ourselves in the historical context that shaped this era. The 12th century was a period of transformation. Europe was undergoing an economic expansion triggering increased urban growth, intellectual revival, and the growth of centralized monarchies. But it wasn't just a time of burgeoning prosperity. It was also an epoch of struggle and strife. As the West began to flourish, the East was undergoing its own tumultuous changes. The powerful Seljuk Empire was fragmenting, creating a vacuum filled by an ambitious Kurd. Salah had Din Yusuf, known to the West as Saladin. In 1187, Saladin dealt a crushing blow to the Latin kingdom of Jerusalem at the Battle of Hattin, reclaiming the holy city for Islam after nearly 90 years of Christian rule. This seismic event echoed across the Western world, resonating with a potent mix of fear and religious fervor. Pope Urban III is said to have died of shock upon hearing the news. His successor, Pope Gregory VIII, was quick to issue a papal bull, or Dieter Tremendi, calling for a new crusade to recapture Jerusalem. It was within this charged atmosphere that the European monarchs, driven by a mix of religious piety, chivalric duty, and perhaps political ambition, took up the cross for what would become known as the Third Crusade. Enter Richard the Lionheart. Born on September 8, 1157, to Henry II of England and Eleanor of Aquitaine, Richard's life was infused with the political intrigues and power dynamics that defined Europe's ruling class. An upbringing punctuated by rebellions against his father, a succession struggle with his brothers, and a mother who played her children against each other in the great game of power, Richard was a man forged in the crucible of political conflict. With his ascension to the throne in 1189, Richard inherited a kingdom fraught with tension, both domestically and abroad. Yet Richard was not merely a king. He was a warrior, at heart a man who had cultivated a reputation for his military prowess, strategic acumen, and personal bravery. When the call for the Third Crusade sounded, it found in Richard a ready and eager participant. For Richard... The crusade was more than a political venture or a religious obligation. It was a challenge he readily accepted, a chance to showcase his martial ability and secure his place in the annals of history. As we delve into the intricacies of Richard's campaign, we'll see how the backdrop of the age, the interplay of religion and politics, the personal motivations of a complex man, all coalesce at the siege of Acre, a battlefield epic, that would seal Richard's legacy as one of the Middle Ages' most legendary figures. Understanding the motives that drove Richard to join the Third Crusade requires not only an examination of the man himself, but also the broader landscape of political and religious expectations of the era. Richard, the newly minted King of England, stood at the threshold of a changing world, one where notions of piety, duty and prestige became entwined with the concept of holy war. Richard's commitment to the cause of the Crusades was in part shaped by the fervent religious climate of his age. The late 12th century was a time when the Church held sway over the minds and hearts of the masses and the nobility alike. 
The Crusades were seen as a pilgrimage, a path to salvation, a way to atone for sins and gain spiritual merit. For a man of Richard's intense personal faith, the call to retake the Holy Land would have been a powerful motivator. But the Crusades were not only a religious endeavour, they also held considerable political and social significance. The nobility, in particular, embraced the chivalric ideals that were bound up with crusading. In an age where personal honour and reputation were invaluable currency, the image of the noble Christian warrior embarking on a sacred quest captured the popular imagination. Richard, ever conscious of his public image, would have been acutely aware of the prestige attached to leading a crusade. As such, the Third Crusade provided an opportunity for Richard to bolster his personal glory, showcasing his prowess on an international stage. The fall of Jerusalem to Saladin had sent shockwaves throughout the Christian world. The news from the Holy Land of the loss of Christendom's prized possession came as a devastating blow. The city, held by the Christians for almost a century since its capture in the First Crusade in 1099, had been a shining beacon of Christian triumph. Its loss was perceived as nothing short of a catastrophe, a direct challenge to the faith, a desecration that could not be tolerated. The collective call to arms that echoed across Europe was one that Richard could not ignore. Richard's response was decisive. On the day of his coronation, July 6, 1189, he announced his intention to embark on a crusade pledging to devote his resources to the retaking of Jerusalem. For Richard... The cause was personal, the stakes high. He sold castles, lordships, privileges, and even official positions to fund his expedition, demonstrating his fierce determination and commitment. It was a gamble, one that he hoped would cement his legacy as a great warrior king. In this crusading fervor, Richard found allies. King Philip II of France, Duke Leopold of Austria, and various other nobles rallied to the cause. This assembling of forces was not just a military coalition. It was a testament to the powerful pull of the crusading ethos that bridged borders and unified rivals. This multinational force, with Richard as one of its most formidable leaders, set sail for the Holy Land, carrying with them the hopes and prayers of Christendom. As we journey with Richard towards the beleaguered city of Acre, we do so with the understanding that his participation in the Crusades was driven by a complex interplay of personal faith, chivalric idealism, and political ambition. The man who had earned the epithet Lionheart was marching not just towards a siege, but towards a destiny that would forever etch his name in the annals of history. The city of Acre, known as Acco to its inhabitants, had been under siege for almost two years before Richard the Lionheart even set foot on Holy Land soil. A significant port city on the eastern coast of the Mediterranean, Acre, was a jewel much coveted for its strategic and commercial value. In many ways, the city was the gatekeeper of the Holy Land, its fall or survival often swaying the balance of power in the region. Acre had been in Muslim control since 1187, captured by Saladin in the aftermath of the disastrous Battle of Hattin. However, the beleaguered city had come under attack by the forces of Guy de Lusignan, the deposed king of Jerusalem, in August 1189. Lusignan, like Richard, had a point to prove. He had been the commander at Hattin, and his catastrophic defeat had led to his capture and the loss of Jerusalem. This siege was his chance at redemption, an opportunity to regain his lost honour and kingdom. Yet the task was gargantuan. Acre was a fortress, secured by imposing walls and towers, its defences bolstered by the strategic genius of Saladin, who ensured the city was well stocked and prepared for a lengthy siege. The Crusaders, although numerous, were a motley force, pulled together from various regions, driven more by fervour than cohesive strategy. Their initial attempts to take the city were met with fierce resistance, and the siege turned into a stalemate. For almost two years, the Crusaders maintained their grip around Acre, their spirits upheld by sheer faith and determination. The conditions, however, were harsh. Food was scarce, disease was rampant, and death was a constant companion. 
Their grim predicament was further exacerbated by Saladin's forces, who periodically launched attacks from outside the city to keep the Crusaders on their toes. Yet the Crusaders held on, their eyes set firmly on the city that was tantalizingly close, yet agonizingly out of reach. The roles of key players during this initial phase of the siege are noteworthy. Apart from Guy de Lusignan, there was Conrad of Montferrat, a skilled and seasoned leader who became a prominent figure in the Crusader camp. His tactical acumen and diplomatic skills were instrumental in keeping the Crusader cause alive. There was also Queen Sibylla of Jerusalem, whose stalwart support and rallying presence served as a beacon of hope for the Crusaders. Meanwhile, Saladin, ever the astute commander, managed to keep the Crusader forces at bay while ensuring Acker's defences remained solid. Yet, despite their valiant efforts, the city remained elusive. The Crusaders needed a catalyst, a change in their fortune, something that would breathe new life into their weary campaign. It would come in the form of a man, a lion-hearted king, sailing towards them from across the sea. Richard the Lionheart was on his way, bringing with him a surge of hope and the promise of victory. As the Crusaders clung to their faith and their mission, little did they know that their ordeal was about to transform into one of the most epic sieges in history. The stage was set, the players were in place, and the curtain was about to rise on the grand drama that was the Siege of Acre. Richard's journey to the Holy Land was not without its own drama. Setting sail from England in 1190, the English king found himself drawn into the complexities of Mediterranean politics. Stops in Sicily and Cyprus resulted in confrontations, treaties, and even the annexation of Cyprus into his dominions. Yet, for all of the distractions, Richard's goal remained unchanged. His eyes were set firmly on the Holy Land and the recapture of Jerusalem. By the time Richard arrived in Acre in June 1191, the Crusader's spirit had been severely tested. The lengthy siege had taken its toll. Yet the arrival of the Lionheart, along with his fresh troops and resources, brought a gust of optimism that breathed life into the weary Crusaders. Here was the warrior king, the hero, who carried with him the hopes of Christendom. His arrival marked a turning point in the siege, instilling in the Crusaders a renewed sense of purpose. With his military acumen and charismatic leadership, Richard quickly asserted control over the Crusader forces. He reorganized the troops, tightened the blockade, and executed a series of aggressive assaults on the city. Richard's use of heavy siege equipment the catapults and trebuchets was particularly effective, causing significant damage to Acker's formidable walls. Richard's presence also intensified the naval blockade. Utilizing the English and French fleets, he managed to tighten the stranglehold around the city, cutting off its lifeline to the outside world. This dual threat on land and sea added pressure on the defenders of Acker and weakened the city's resolve. Richard's influence wasn't merely limited to military tactics. He demonstrated an ability to navigate the delicate politics of the Crusader camp. His relationship with King Philip of France, while fraught with rivalry and tension, remained crucial to the Crusaders' united front. In a camp torn between different leaders, Richard's charismatic persona and undisputed military skills granted him a distinctive position of influence. His dynamic leadership breathed fresh vigour into the beleaguered crusaders. Men who had been on the brink of despair found new courage in their hearts. The tide seemed to be turning. But the city of Acre, though besieged and battered, remained resilient, its walls still standing. Saladin, ever the formidable opponent, continued to rally his forces, maintaining pressure on the crusader camp. The siege of Acre had reached a critical juncture. It had become more than just a battle for a city. It was a test of endurance, a clash of wills, and at the center of it all stood Richard the Lionheart. His decisions, actions, and leadership in the days to come would dictate the fate of Acre, the Crusaders, and ultimately his own place in history. The narrative so far presents a vivid picture of the siege as the stage for a grand drama with its heroes and villains, highs and lows, hopes and despairs. Yet, for all his charisma and military prowess, 
Richard faced a daunting task. Packer was not yet won, and the days to come would test the mettle of the Lionheart. The siege of Acker, which had already stretched over two years, entered an unprecedented phase of intensity following Richard's arrival. The Lionheart's innovative tactics, relentless assaults, and charismatic leadership had not only invigorated the besieging forces, but had also forced the defenders of Acker into a desperate corner. As the summer of 1191 unfurled, the conflict reached a feverish pitch, with the outcome poised on a knife edge. For Richard, the siege was more than just a military campaign. It was a grand stage upon which he showcased his prowess as a leader and a warrior, hoping to etch an indelible mark on the annals of history. He led from the front, his valour infectious, his determination unyielding, Richard was not just a commander directing from the back lines, but a hero who fought shoulder to shoulder with his men, embodying the chivalric ideal of a warrior king. Acker's fortifications were robust, designed to withstand the most brutal of onslaughts. Yet Richard's persistent assaults began to wear them down gradually. His siege weapons hurled massive stones at the city walls, slowly grinding down their once impenetrable facade. Richard also cleverly exploited Acker's terrain, targeting vulnerable points and making strategic use of his forces to maximize pressure on the defenders. On the naval front, Richard's strategy proved equally potent. The fleet under his command tightened the maritime blockade, effectively severing Acker's access to supplies and reinforcements. The city, hemmed in by land and sea, started to feel the pinch of isolation, its resilience tested to the breaking point. However, the Muslim forces, led by the indomitable Saladin, were not to be subdued easily. Saladin, whose military acumen and diplomatic skills had earned him an empire, was a formidable adversary. His strategy was a counter-siege, his forces encamped around the Crusaders, keeping them in check and launching periodic attacks to destabilize them. Despite the increasing pressure, Saladin refused to yield, his tenacity a reflection of the city he sought to defend. Inside the city, the situation was increasingly dire. Food and water supplies dwindled, disease took its toll and morale sank. Yet the defenders fought bravely, hoping against hope for a miracle to save them from their seemingly inevitable fate. The very air within the city walls seemed to throb with a sense of desperate defiance. The city's denizens standing firm, even as their world crumbled around them. By early July, after weeks of relentless assault and titan blockade, the city's defences began to falter significantly. The inhabitants of Acre, starved and exhausted, were on the brink. On July 12, 1191, under unbearable pressure, the city finally capitulated. Richard the Lionheart had achieved what had seemed impossible. Acre had fallen. The fall of Acre marked a decisive turning point in the Third Crusade. The hard-fought victory bolstered the morale of the Crusaders, establishing Richard as a formidable leader. The Lionheart's triumph was seen as a validation of his claim to the throne and a testament to his prowess. However, the victory was also a stark reminder of the cost of war. Thousands had perished, and a once thriving city lay battered and bruised. In the grand tapestry of history, the fall of Acre was a bold stroke, a defining moment in the narrative of the Crusades. It showcased the remarkable endurance of the human spirit, the terrifying power of faith, and the devastating cost of conflict. It was a chapter written in blood and fire, forever immortalizing the figures who played their parts on this grand stage. The victory at Acre, while momentous, marked the beginning of an intricate phase of negotiations between Richard and Saladin. Acre had fallen, but the battle was far from over. The city's surrender terms, the fate of its inhabitants, and the destiny of the Holy Cross, a relic of immense religious significance allegedly in Saladin's possession, were yet to be determined. The negotiations began with a proposition from Richard. The Lionheart demanded the release of all Christian captives, the surrender of the Holy Cross, and a hefty ransom for the release of the Muslim prisoners. The terms were stern. 
reflecting Richard's confidence in his victorious position and his determination to maximize his advantage. Saladin, on the other hand, despite the loss of Akka, remained a skilled and capable negotiator. The Sultan played for time, hoping to gather the necessary resources while keeping his adversary at bay. His responses were measured and tactful, aiming to minimize the impact of the defeat. However, the negotiations soon hit a wall. Saladin's perceived delay in meeting Richard's demands tested the Lionheart's patience. The tension was further exacerbated by the communication gap and cultural misunderstandings between the two camps. Both leaders were caught in a power play, each maneuvering to gain the upper hand. While the negotiations dragged on, another development threatened to destabilize the already strained situation. The massacre at Ayadia, Ayadia, a fortress positioned between Acre and Jaffa, was the site of a horrific episode that exposed the brutal side of Richard the Lionheart. In August 1191, Richard decided to move his forces south towards Jaffa, leaving a part of his army behind to keep an eye on Saladin's forces. The march was interrupted by a surprise attack from Saladin. Despite the initial shock, Richard's forces managed to counter the Muslim forces effectively, eventually driving them back in what would later be known as the Battle of Arsuf. But the incident at Ayadie would forever mar the image of Richard in the history of the Crusades. Frustrated by Saladin's delaying tactics, Richard took a drastic and horrific decision. He ordered the execution of the roughly 2,700 Muslim prisoners in Acre. Men, women, and children who were used as bargaining chips in the negotiations were ruthlessly slaughtered in what was a shocking violation of the chivalric norms. This incident a chilling testament to the ruthlessness of war and a stark departure from Richard's earlier image as a chivalrous knight sent shockwaves across both the Christian and Muslim world. It hardened the resolve of Saladin and his followers, while it also stirred disquiet among Richard's allies. The massacre at Ayadia added a dark tinge to Richard's victory at Acre. It complicated the already fraught negotiations. The fall of Acre had marked a high point in Richard's crusading career. However, the subsequent negotiations and the episode at Ayadia demonstrated that victory on the battlefield did not automatically translate into a seamless political triumph. Richard was caught in a web of diplomatic complexities, and his actions, born out of frustration and tactical considerations, would cast a long, dark shadow over his crusading legacy. The aftermath of Acre thus provides a deeper insight into the complex character of Richard the Lionheart. It showcases a leader who was not only a skilled warrior, but also a ruthless tactician who could resort to extreme measures to achieve his goals. Yet it also paints a picture of a leader grappling with the harsh realities of power, where moral lines often blur and decisions carry heavy consequences. The fall of Acre, the negotiations, and the shocking episode at Ayadia were not the only challenges Richard faced during his time in the Holy Land. Beneath the unified facade of the Crusaders, simmering rivalries and political maneuverings threatened to fracture their ranks, presenting yet another layer of complexity in the intricate tapestry of the Third Crusade. At the heart of these internal tensions was the contentious issue of who would be crowned King of Jerusalem, a title of immense symbolic and political importance. The previous holder, Baldwin IV, had died without direct heirs, triggering a fierce succession dispute that was entangled with the wider dynamics of the Crusade. The main contenders were G. of Lusignan, the husband of Baldwin's sister Sibylla, and Conrad of Montferrat, the husband of Baldwin's half-sister Isabella. Each had their own base of supporters and had managed to secure influential allies within the Crusader ranks. G., despite his less than stellar performance as a ruler, was favoured by Richard. The Lionheart saw in G. a pliable ally who would likely align with England's interests in the region. His claim was further bolstered by his possession of the physical symbol of the kingdom, the relic known as the Holy Cross, which he had inherited from his deceased wife. Conrad, on the other hand, was backed by Philip of France and Leopold of Austria, both of whom had grown increasingly wary of Richard's expanding influence. 
Conrad was a seasoned leader with considerable military experience, having successfully defended the city of Tyre from Saladin's forces during the earlier stages of the crusade. This rivalry between Guy and Conrad was not just about individual ambition. It was a reflection of the competing interests of the European powers involved in the crusade. Each saw in their candidate a means to assert their influence in the strategically crucial region of the Levant. As Richard grappled with the external threat posed by Saladin, he also had to navigate these internal tensions. He used a combination of diplomacy, strategic alliances, and even threats to maintain cohesion within the Crusader camp. However, these efforts were not always successful. Richard's favoritism towards Guy and his increasingly autocratic leadership style stirred resentment among his allies. The friction reached a peak when Richard insulted Leopold by tearing down his banner from the walls of Acre, a blatant affront to the Austrian duke's honour. This incident caused a significant strain within the Crusader alliance with Philip II and Leopold V, leaving the crusade prematurely. The political complexities within the Crusader camp underscore the fact that the Crusades were not just about religious fervor. They were also about power, influence, and the competing ambitions of the European nobility. The Crusaders, despite their shared goal of reclaiming Jerusalem, were divided by individual and national interests. Richard's handling of these internal dynamics paints a picture of a leader, adept at political maneuvering. However, it also shows his struggles to maintain unity among his allies and his tendency to let personal biases influence his strategic decision. These political intricacies, rivalries, and the resulting tensions would have profound implications for the Crusaders' campaign in the Holy Land, adding another layer of complexity to the already fraught saga of Richard the Lionheart's siege of Acre. As Richard the Lionheart navigated the complex political landscape within the Crusader camp, the military front was far from dormant. The Battle of Arsuf, fought on 7th September 1191, provides a striking tableau of Richard's military genius, his grasp of strategy, and his personal bravery on the battlefield. Leaving the captured city of Acre, Richard marched his army southwards toward Jaffa, a vital port city and the springboard for the planned assault on Jerusalem. Saladin, observing the movement of the Crusader force, realized this was an opportunity he could not afford to miss. Richard's horses were forced to march through a narrow coastal strip with the sea on one side and the forested hills of Asaf on the other. It was a challenging terrain offering Saladin's troops, who were familiar with the landscape, the perfect chance to launch surprise attacks. And Saladin, the seasoned tactician, saw this chance and acted upon it. However, what ensued was not a straightforward engagement, but a vivid demonstration of Richard's remarkable military acumen. The Lionheart had anticipated the possibility of an ambush. He organized his troops in a defensive formation, with crossbowmen and archers positioned to provide cover for the knights and infantry. Saladin's forces began their assault with hit-and-run tactics, hoping to disrupt the Crusaders' formation and provoke them into breaking ranks. However, Richard, understanding the strategy behind these manoeuvres, ordered his troops to maintain formation and hold their ground. This discipline under pressure was a testament to Richard's leadership and his ability to command respect and obedience from his troops. Despite the incessant attacks, the Crusader army kept its cohesion, slowly progressing towards Jaffa. But Richard knew that holding the formation was not enough. He had to strike a decisive blow to demoralize Saladin's forces and secure his path to Jaffa. He waited for the opportune moment when Saladin's troops were within close proximity. And then, with a powerful call, he ordered a counterattack. What followed was a charge led by the Knights Hospitaller, the military monastic order renowned for their martial skills. The sudden aggressive move caught Saladin's forces off guard, causing a wave of chaos and panic in their ranks. The tide of the battle turned and the Muslim forces retreated, marking a decisive victory for Richard and the Crusaders. The Battle of Arsuf was a significant episode that reflected Richard's strategic brilliance and personal valour. 
His ability to maintain order amid chaos, his understanding of enemy tactics, and his decisive use of shock action stand as testament to his reputation as one of the greatest military leaders of his time. However, beyond the immediate victory, the Battle of Asuf had broader implications. It boosted the morale of the Crusader forces and secured their path to Jaffa. It demonstrated Richard's military prowess to his allies and enemies alike. But it also strained his already tense relations with Saladin, making the prospects for a negotiated peace more elusive. Moreover, while the victory at Asuf showcased Richard's skills as a military leader, it also highlighted the daunting task ahead, the capture of Jerusalem. Richard had proven his mettle on the battlefield, but the biggest challenge still lay ahead, waiting within the formidable walls of the Holy City. Following the morale, Boosting victory at Asuf, Richard found himself at a crucial juncture. The road to Jerusalem lay open before him, the glimmering jewel of the Holy Land that was the heart and soul of the Crusade's cause. The city's symbolic significance was unparalleled. It was the birthplace of Christendom and the site of the Holy Sepulchre, the place where Jesus was believed to have been buried and resurrected. However, in the winter of 1190, one, Richard faced an agonizing decision, one that would define his leadership on the course of the Third Crusade. Twice he led his forces within sight of Jerusalem's formidable walls, and twice he chose to withdraw. To understand Richard's decision, we need to comprehend the logistical and strategic challenges he faced. First and foremost, Jerusalem was a well-fortified city with a strong defensive perimeter. The mere prospect of besieging it, let alone capturing it, would entail a monumental military effort. Winter posed another significant challenge. Cold temperatures, rain and muddy terrain made maintaining a protracted siege a daunting task. The Crusader army was already stretched thin in terms of resources and manpower, and the rigors of winter would only exacerbate the situation. Equally significant was the strategic dimension. Even if Richard had managed to capture Jerusalem, holding it would have been another matter entirely. Saladin's forces were still potent and numerous, capable of launching a counter-offensive to retake the city. Richard was a warrior king, but he was also a pragmatist. He understood the cost and risk of assaulting Jerusalem, and he chose the path of caution. It was a decision that frustrated many within his ranks especially those fueled by religious zeal, who saw the capture of Jerusalem as the ultimate goal of the crusade. The bitter truth was that, despite the triumphant victories at Acre and Asuf, the ultimate objective of the crusade recapturing Jerusalem remained unfulfilled. This realization was a harsh blow to the spirit of the crusaders and a stark reminder of the tremendous challenges they faced. Richard's decision not to assault Jerusalem was met with criticism, both in his time and in the centuries that followed. To many, it represented a failure of nerve, a lack of resolve. But from a strategic perspective, it was a decision made in the face of impossible odds, a decision driven by pragmatism over passion. Richard's inability to capture Jerusalem, however, did not spell the end of his efforts in the Holy Land. He continued to strategize, fight, and negotiate, remaining a formidable opponent, to Saladin. He shifted his focus to fortifying the coastal cities and strengthening the position of the Latin states in the region, all while maintaining a tenuous truce with Saladin. These actions, however, could not eclipse the fact that the ultimate prize, Jerusalem, remained out of reach. Richard's crusade in the Holy Land was a story of military brilliance, political intrigue, and high drama— but it was also a story marked by an unfulfilled dream, a mission that fell tantalizingly short of its grand objective. As the struggle for Jerusalem reached a standstill and the strains of a prolonged military campaign became increasingly apparent, Richard found himself facing a difficult choice. With a hostile home front and his position as King of England under threat, the pragmatic decision was clear. Negotiations for peace. Thus, the Treaty of Jaffa came into being in September 1192, marking a temporary cessation of hostilities between Richard and Saladin. 
The treaty was a compromise, granting Christians the right to visit the holy sites in Jerusalem without paying taxes while allowing Muslims to retain control over the city. The coastal city, states from Tyre to Jaffa, remained under Christian control, strengthening the survival of the Crusader states. It was a pragmatic solution, one that reflected the reality of the situation, an impasse where neither side could assert complete victory. Yet this treaty, as momentous as it was, represented an anticlimactic end to the grand objectives of the Third Crusade. The dream of recapturing Jerusalem remained unfulfilled. Despite the tremendous efforts, the bloody battles, and the heroic feats of military brilliance, the ultimate goal slipped through the fingers of the Crusaders. In the broader narrative of the Third Crusade, Richard's journey from the Siege of Acre to the Treaty of Jaffa illuminates the intricate dance of power, strategy, and survival that characterizes any significant historical epic. His story is one of unmatched military prowess, shrewd diplomatic maneuvering, and the gritty determination to hold on to a fragile dream. So, how are we to interpret the Lionheart's crusade and its impact? There are as many perspectives as there are points of view. From one perspective, Richard's crusade was a success. He arrived in a fragmented and demoralized crusader camp and turned the tide of the conflict, winning significant victories, most notably the Siege of Acre and the Battle of Arsul. His diplomatic acumen led to a treaty that allowed for Christian pilgrimages to Jerusalem and bolstered the remaining crusader states. Yet, seen from another angle, his crusade was a failure. The primary objective, the recapture of Jerusalem, remained elusive. His decision to not assault the Holy City, regardless of the practical reasons behind it, was a bitter disappointment to many of his contemporaries and has been a subject of debate among historians. However, casting Richard's crusade in binary terms of success or failure perhaps misses the greater nuances. His journey was marked by victories and setbacks, by shrewd judgment and bitter compromises. It was, above all, a human journey brimming with ambition, courage and the hard realities of leadership. Today, Richard the Lionheart's crusade is remembered for its dramatic battles, its political intrigues and its ultimate inability to recapture Jerusalem. Yet, for our audience of castle enthusiasts, the siege of Acre offers an immersive glimpse into a time when castles were not just magnificent structures, but living, breathing theatres of war and diplomacy, where the course of history was charted and changed. In Richard's story, we encounter a time of chivalry and carnage, of faith and fanaticism, of towering personalities clashing and colluding on the grand stage of history. It was a time when the world was as wide as the sweep of a knight's sword, and the echo of that time, the roar of the lion heart, still resonates in the stones of Acre. We hope you enjoyed this episode of the Saving Castles podcast. Stay tuned for our next episode, where we'll continue to explore the fascinating world of castles and chateaus. Don't miss out and subscribe to our podcast to get notified when new episodes are released. For more information about us and our work, visit savingcastles.com. Thank you for listening.